in the name of God. Amen. Please be seated. It was good to get away a bit the past couple of weeks, but it's also good to be home. Michael and I had a nice time driving in a big circle around about half of the country when seeing friends and family that we haven't seen in entirely too long. But by the time we made it home, we were ready to be in our own beds and in our own routines, and perhaps more significantly, our dogs, who we had dragged along with us, were also ready to get back into their own routines. But it was really nice seeing people, particularly my younger nephews, who I hadn't seen in over three years. It's good to rediscover that some things never change. Three years ago, a fun little game was played. Uh, it was called, well, I mean, it was, it was, who's the cutest? It was a game that Michael and Gaines, the smaller of my twin nephews, would play. They would argue back and forth about which one is cuter than the other. And Gaines would just squeal in delight as he made his case. But now, with the advantage of a few years, the argument is almost the same, but it has matured a little bit. Now it's about who's the tallest one, and Gaines comes up to about here, or who's the smartest one, or who's the coolest one. Gaines is a cute little squirt, and he insists that he holds all of those titles and more. And the argument now isn't made with shouts or squeals, but with matter-of-fact assurance, manifesting perfect pre-teen disengagement. Gaines will declare, well, obviously I'm taller than you. So it was funny to me to encounter this gospel lesson for my first Sunday back after spending time with my family and these silly little faux debates that are part of our tradition. The disciples are doing the same thing. But for them, it's not just fun and games. They really are wondering, who is the greatest? Jesus reminds them, it is not who you think it is. My nephews and my brothers' games aside, we really do usually miss the point about greatness in our culture. Just as much as those first followers of Jesus missed the point back then. I'm ashamed to admit it, Michael and I have been watching some trash TV this summer. Some friends got us to start watching the Bachelor series with them. It's easy to get sucked into the stories that the producers pull together and manufacture from the footage that they accumulate. But even so, I sometimes catch myself thinking about how pitiful some of these people's lives must really be. Some of them have jumped into the deep end of tying their entire existence and their self-worth to the accumulation of fame. Who has the most followers on social media? What can they do to get more? For some of them, relationships and even mature humanity take a back seat to that unquenchable lust for fame. But you don't have to be a reality TV character to be influenced by this distorted vision of success. All of us are constantly influenced by the wider popular culture to be some archetype of perfection, some archetype of idealism that has little to do with the ideal that Jesus called us toward. We're constantly being urged to be taller, sexier, slimmer, to seem happier, more extroverted. Those first disciples were like today's TV reality stars. They were striving for greatness by the dominant standards of their culture. Things like power, influence, wealth, and independence. It never occurred to them, just as it never occurs to most of the people in our lives, 
that a better goal might be something different. Maybe it doesn't matter who sits next to the leader as much as it matters to emulate the leader's ways. Maybe it doesn't matter how many followers you have as much as it matters how you are leading. Maybe it doesn't matter how powerful you are, how rich you are, if you only use your power or your wealth only for yourself. It's an unmistakable and fascinating dichotomy to hear the disciples jockeying for greatness, as they understood it at least, at the same time that Jesus was passing through Galilee and hoping to go unnoticed. They were hoping for strength and power. He was hoping for privacy, to further his mission and to prepare them in ways that they needed to be prepared. Have you ever had one of those light bulb moments where everything seemed to come together and make sense in ways that it hadn't before? Well, this is the story of people before that moment. The story of missing what was right in front of their faces. Hearing the words, but not really connecting to their meanings. We've all been there. If we're honest, we are there a lot. But only the wisest among us recognize it. But the good news, the gospel, is that Jesus is patient. God was patient through countless generations, and Jesus is patient still. The Holy Spirit is still quietly nudging us, even in our persistent stubbornness. We don't really get it. We still fall short. We still make mistakes. We don't follow Christ perfectly. We strive for the wrong things. But even so, God is still helping us through. Even in our shortcomings, we never come up short of the love of God. We are enough for that. And when we realize that, that's when we start to follow Christ. That's when we start to get it, even if just in tiny bits. The secret is, we are the greatest. At least for this mission at hand, this calling to follow Christ. All the rest is just extra. We are good enough with room to spare. Thanks be to God. Amen.